<laughs> well, people of the internet, welcome to Atheist Edge. I am your host, Kaz, and today I have Dr. Travis Dickinson joining me today. Dr. Dickinson, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, I, I didn't have audio for this second there, but I'm good now. Yeah, yeah I messed up really bad there. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, you're fine. Dr. Dickinson. <laughs> So you are currently uh, the professor of philosophy at Dallas Baptist University, where you teach all things philosophical. I understand you're from New Jersey. You went to uh, Alaska Bible College, uh, Southern California. You went to uh, Biola University. You uh, also went to the University of Iowa, where you got your PhD in philosophy. You're an author and a speaker, and uh, you also have made a few appearances here on Atheist Edge over the years. Um, is there anything else I missed? Oh, that's that's more than enough. Yeah. <laughs> OK, well, I really do appreciate you coming to join me today to discuss your blog post. Um, yeah. The non-religious argument for the personhood of the unborn. Um, so what I did was I. Read your post and copied it into a document and just went through it line by line. Sure. And kind okay. of uh, critiqued it. And I wanted to just kind of uh, present my arguments here and see how Love you to. reacted to them. Sounds great. Um, Sounds great. Do you want to just give a brief overview, quick uh, overview of the whole yeah, thing? Yeah, sure. Sure. So um, back, the backstory a little bit, just briefly, is, of course, Roe v. Wade has been overturned and there's been all kinds of, uh, let's call it dialogue. I don't know if it's always really dialogue, but sort of yelling at each other, that kind of thing going on. And uh, it occurred to me that, um, and, and it's been a thought for a long time, that one does not need to be a religious person to believe in the full personhood of the unborn. Uh, that just seems obvious. Obvious Again, that's that's a really modest claim. I'm not saying one ought to or needs to uh, believe in the full person of the unborn, but just saying, first of all, that one could, uh, of course, hold to the full personhood of the unborn. And then, but then I give an argument for it in the, in the post. And the argument is that uh, I think that we are aware of, of ourselves, not as mere bodies, uh, but as conscious selves, um, I, I, you know, the word soul, people think religious immediately. And, and for me, Plato talks about the soul and, you know, Plato's religious in a sense, but not the sort of religious that I think a lot of people, uh, sort of automatically take issue with. Um, and, you know, he's certainly more philosophical. So, so I want to think of us as philosophical souls. Um, and because of that fact, uh, I think that makes sense of why we have any rights at all. Uh, because if all that we are are, you know, physical particles, um, that kind of a thing, then none of us have rights, uh, even adults. And, and I think it's a consistent view if somebody were to deny that. But that's not I think that's a huge cost that I wouldn't certainly wouldn't recommend somebody saying that even adults uh, and, and older children and, and children, you know, all, uh, you know, fail to have rights. Um, I think it's sort of this I sort of write the post in a way, assuming that most of us are going to agree that uh, human persons have rights. But how do we ground that? It just seems impossible to me. And I don't use that word lightly. I think it seems impossible to me to ground absolute rights, uh, sort of exceptionless rights, uh, inalienable rights, if you like, um, in just physical particles. And so I think it's because we're aware of ourselves as something more than that, that we treat other humans uh, with rights and dignity and respect. And there, and so th sort of the, then the conclusion is, well, when, if that's what we are as human persons, then when did we become that? Um, and I think there's no non-arbitrary marker. And all it is is a marker for me. Uh, I think it makes no sense to talk about the, the rights of a sperm and an egg, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that it makes a lot of sense to talk about a uh, almost born you know, a, a baby that's just about to be born as having some rights, at least some dignity, at least, if not the right to life. And then you just sort of dial it back. Like what could be a non-arbitrary marker from, from when, from whence uh, these rights uh, sort of spring. And I think conception just makes the most sense to me though. I'm not, 
completely, you know, I, I don't know if that's, I, that's my view. Um, but I'm less concerned about that and more concerned with that when there's conscious experiences, then there are rights. Uh, why is that? Because we are souls. And I think that, that being uh, uh, a human soul gives us a kind of dignity uh, and, and some, some personal rights and liberties that um, a bag of particles doesn't have. So that's, that's kind of the argument in short, but love to hear what your, your thoughts are on it. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a lot to get into there. Um, yes. I want to just give you my uh, my broad uh, approach to the entire subject really quick. Yeah, do so. So you can yeah, great. know where I'm coming from. Uh, I have no problem, personally, giving assigning personhood, humanity, to a fetus or embryo from moment of conception onward. To me, yeah. I think that those are uh, totally irrelevant to the conversation. Um the thing about it is the rights of the mother, the justifications or lack thereof uh, for the abortion. Whether or not this act is a good thing or a bad thing is a separate question to me from whether or not this is a person or not. Because we have examples, clear examples to me, of human beings persons that are just we are justified in taking their lives uh, from you know a psychopath trying to kill you um somebody who's uh in a war type situation there, there yep. are other examples i could think of probably agreed but uh agreed we can hash the, the the details of that in a little bit but that's just my broad approach so you think the the mother has the justification to end the life or, you know, however we would characterize it. Um, it's hardly the mother doing it necessarily, but she's definitely part of the process. So she's justified in getting an abortion, uh, even if the fetus at whatever stage of development has human rights. Right. That's where you'd fall. Correct. And then what's, what's that justification? It might be helpful to know what you think justifies uh, the, her doing that. The threat to her life. Okay. The, the inherent so danger that only, pregnancy poses to her life. And that's so only when the, the, the life of the mother is in jeopardy? No, uh, the, the inherent danger that it poses just by virtue of it being uh, a, 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 a large body being pushed through a very small orifice and the trauma that is entailed with that. Okay. So potential danger. So, so right. your, your view would be something like any pregnancy is by its very nature, a potential danger to the life of the mother. Um, right. Therefore she has the right to end that uh, threat. The example would be, I don't feel potential that a person has to, right. I don't feel like a person has to wait until a person is shooting at them to defend their life with lethal force. I think that there are yes. several places way before okay. that that you are able to. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, interesting. Yeah. But I, I don't want to jump all the way there just yet. We're just now starting. Yeah, so right. Right, right, Let's right. go through the, the, the blog, can we? <laughs> um, please. I please. have uh, made overlays uh, of your of your discussion, and I wanted to kind of go through them, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, so I wanted to touch on this point here uh, about physicalism. The unborn for the yes. physicalist really is just a clump of cells. Uh, it seems that they're, it's perfectly morally acceptable to remove and destroy uh, mere clumps of cells for physicalists. Um, and I wanted to ask you, um, does personhood, in your view, automatically uh, preclude abortion? Uh, no. So I would definitely take the view that if the life of the mother is in jeopardy and, you know, this, this, it's it, one thing that I, in any sort of discussion like this, want to say from the beginning, like, I think it's messy, <laughs> right? This is a messy topic because you're not going to get 
always very clear sort of like markers and boundaries and what is and what isn't. But that's okay. A lot of moral reasoning goes that way. Um, you, you have to make a decision at the end of the day. But I think uh, in a very real sense, if the life of the mother is in jeopardy, then I think it's it's morally permissible to um, to uh, perform an abortion in that case. But um, again, I would sort of, I would think of this as a self-defense. So that that is more clearly, more um, obviously to me, a, a, a case of kind of self-defense in that sense. Um, and right, the, the, the potential doesn't seem to me, just a, just initial reaction to your view, and you don't have to respond to it yet, but, but I think what I would say, the reason why I do think when the life of the mother is in jeopardy, it's because there is a kind of like preservation of her own life. Um, now that's just to make it morally permissible. I don't, I, I know of people who have, um, who have chosen to just, you know, um, take whatever, you know, risks that there are to, to themselves to uh, carry their baby to term and so on. But, um, and sometimes those are happy endings and sometimes not, to be honest. But, um, I think, though, a lot of a lot of the cases, most of the cases, one doesn't have to perform an abortion necessarily, um, though, you know, I, I'm I'll be the first to admit that I'm coming to those sort of medical issues as certainly a lay person. So um, I, I may not get all these details exactly right. But my understanding is that oftentimes it's something like going through chemotherapy. Right. So somebody these friends of ours had. Um, were pregnant and she found out she was, uh, had breast cancer. And so she had to make that really, really difficult decision of doing chemotherapy, knowing that chemotherapy would almost certainly cause the death of her fetus. Um, right. And I think in that case, she's, it's morally permissible to go through with that, especially because that's not intending to end the life of the unborn. Um, right. And, you know, I believe in God too. So I believe that there are miracles happen. And I think that God could save the unborn if he chose to, and it may not. And so in in the case that I'm referring to, she actually, they, they did go through it. The, the fetus uh, died due to the chemotherapy most likely. And she, she also unfortunately passed away. So this really tragic story all, all the way around, but those are, that's what I kind of mean by the messiness of all this. Like none of this is easy and there's going to be, the second you think you've got this really clear criterion of when it's permissible, when it's not, some case will come along that will say that doesn't fall neatly in those sort of categories. And so, uh, but no, I definitely think there are the, uh, the life of the mom mother is, especially when there's a, um, yeah, the pregnancy, especially when it's, it's a sort of intention that the intentions behind it is to cure the say cancer or, 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 or maybe not cure, but, you know, uh, treat the cancer and an in, in, in unintended consequences that the child will most likely die. Okay, great. So we're not too far off from each other. Uh, at okay. This uh, we are going to end up, I guess, probably differing on where exactly to draw the line as far sure. as where what the threat, the threat level or perceived yeah. threat level might be and right. how how to react to that threat yeah but um but i think with the uh, one thing to push back a little bit uh, also of what you said is to me the person her hood issue is is fundamental because i think if again if we're just talking about a clump of cells then there's not much of a discussion to be had but the the problem with that of course is that if the fetus is a clump of cells then probably uh, i would think the view would also be that you and i are clumps of cells and i don't see then a problem ending the life of a clump of cells even if it's an adult size so that that's what i'm i guess where i would push on the personhood issue of being really fundamental because that's how i think we ground rights at all so that I'm not sure that the mother has any rights of self-preservation or anything, um, not any rights to it. She can do whatever she wants, of course, in a sense. Uh, but if she's just a clump of cells, she doesn't have the right to life either. And that's why I think that what what the human personhood is, first of all, 
is sort of that necessary metaphysics that we have to do in order to then weigh in on, okay, who, who's right trumps who's and that kind of a thing. Okay. Um, I want to stay on the subject of, um, um, how do we say it? Uh, <laughs> the, the word is uh, farting in my brain right now. Uh, <laughs> physicalism. Talking, or... Physicalism. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I, I guess I would consider myself a physicalist, a materialist uh, thinker. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I don't agree that the the sentiment "I am merely my body" is accurate is an okay. accurate description of my physicalist beliefs. Okay. Um, so. So what else are you? I, I was, then? If you're not merely your body, then what else? I would say I'm also the the sum total of uh, every here here. Here's how I wrote it. I wrote this down to be uh, very concise. I am yeah. more than a physical body. I am everything that has ever happened to my body, and the impression of those event of those events, my history and my future. I am every photon and sound wave that imprints a neural pathway onto my temporal lobe. I am my memories. I am also the sum total of every action potential that I've ever actuated and the moral causal account holder of those initiations. I am what I do. I am my relationships to those around me. I am much more than my body, but none of those things require a ghost in a shell. Yeah. And I don't believe in a ghost in the shell either, but um, I think that I, I'm not hearing anything ontologically beyond your body there um though right. ha happy to hear, hear you point, sort of say specifically what what kinds of things goes beyond your body right so I, I mean it's a little it doesn't seem quite right to say that you are your relationships rather um again we're getting into ontologies where we're saying like what you are what you know what what a thing is um in its most basic sort of fundamental category and that sort of thing um I think you have relationships and that would be the difference of kind of your substance versus properties that you have or aspects or relations that you stand into. So I wouldn't say that you are your relationships, for example, of some of the things that you ran down there, um, but you have relationships, certainly. But what stands in that relationship for you if you're a strict physicalist? There are other versions of physicalism and I wasn't, I, I could have been a little more careful in the post, but uh the strict physicalist says that, no, you just are your body. That's what you are. But then your body may have sort of relations and properties and imprints and things like that uh, and have things happen to it and events and photons and all the rest of, uh, of it. But that's uh, those things are happening to you. That's not you, if that makes sense. OK, um, those are yeah, your I properties. In other words. Yeah. You, you the the there are certain things like relationships are not the ontological essence of who i am and right that you're, that you're there. i, I see and even like your memories um, and things like that because you can lose your memories and it's not like you're losing well, you you're you are and there's also an issue of like identity over time that's going to figure into this uh in some ways so that i lose memories all the time <laughs> the older i get i'm i'm losing memories as almost a hobby now um and uh, I want to say I'm still the same person over time. It's still me, but you certainly don't have numerical identity, what we call numerical identity over time. If you are your memory, like in part your memories, if that makes sense. The, the, the picture that I'm painting here is a, a ship of Theseus type of argument. Yeah. I'm trying to say that all of these things are bits and pieces of the whole. I, I was a nurse for uh, 10 years and I worked with a lot of dementia patients. And oh, I yeah. would say, especially from my own personal experience, uh, and I know this is an anecdote, this is not evidence, but I, I'm sure that we can hash this out further. Um, sure. The memories, especially, are yeah. key aspects of our identity. And once those start to slip away piece by piece, our identity starts to slip away piece by piece until even the people that we love will say, that is not my mom. That is not whoever. You know, yeah. you, who you are does disappear 
with your memories. Uh, yeah, I so I wouldn't. I think people would say that, and and I get what you're saying. Like that's not like evidence, evidence, but like I think people would also say, but yeah, that is my mom. Like if you said, you know, even if they've lost their memories and they're just a sort of shell of their old self, that kind of a thing. And then, but if you say, hey, what are you doing today? I'm going to go visit my mom. You know, like there's still a sense in which that's my mom. Um, it's just that she's changed a lot. And I think myself, if I'm reflecting on that kind of example, I would say, again, I've changed in my aspects. I've changed in my properties. But I would want to say the continuity is has got to be something deeper than just that. Because like you're pointing out, somebody could lose all that. Somebody could gain it all back too, right? I've known people who've had, or I've kn- a friend of mine, his dad uh, had this radical, he, you know, he's a, he was a logger, got hit in the head with a tree and just wandered uh, the state for, for weeks and weeks. They even had the funeral for him because they couldn't find him. They thought he was dead. And he had slowly regained his memories and was able to find his way home kind of thing. Um, so would we say that that's not the same person when they've lost all their memories and then they suddenly become, you know, then they sort of gradually come back to being the same person. That seems just a little, again, ontologically kind of an odd story to tell. It seems to me make more intuitive sense to say, no, it's the same person. They've just gone through these really radical changes in their properties and their aspects. Okay. Um, It's, it just, it seems to me that the, the picture that you paint of the soul of the, of the self, is descriptive of these things the the memories the actions and um the uh the impression uh, i see all of these I things see. put together it seems like we could take all of these things wrap them up in a tiny little bow and call it I soul see. and that would be equivalent yeah now i am making here here's the controversial part perhaps of what i'm saying um okay yeah we're getting into some metaphysics here so it's fun um right when we think about a thing whatever even a material thing our access to that thing is largely by its properties so if you think of like fire hydrant or something like you would describe its shape you would describe its color you would describe its function perhaps that sort of thing and and our access to it is always these properties but when it comes to the soul um what I'm what I'm arguing is that we definitely have access in this sort of self awareness of our conscious experiences, and you're absolutely right. So it's pretty perceptive point that what I would be aware of is be like my memories, my perceptual experiences, just sort of seeing the world and that sort of thing. But I, I'm I, here's the controversial bit that I, I I mean I don't think it's crazy, but I think it's a bit controversial is to say. I think I'm also aware of myself having those experiences, right? So there's a, there's an awareness of self that sort of organizes and unifies all the many sort of experiences that I have, my memories, my, you know, seeing my computer right now, uh, you know, looking out the window and seeing things and hearing things and so on. Those things are incidental or what we might say accidental, but, the self is essential. It, it, it is you and you're aware of yourself having the experiences Then the experiences may come and they may go, they may change, they may stick around for a while, but that doesn't define you. For me, I, I would, I would suggest that that's confusing uh, uh, you with what you experience. Right. But, but our experiences Again, I think in our our self-awareness, we have a kind of experience of the self. Okay. But it's hard. Um, It's super hard to point at because I'm going to probably point at like memories and, you know, uh, seeing something and so on. But then I just ask, like, how could I just what what's having the memory? What's what's seeing the tree? That's where I want to say it's the self, the ego, the soul. Uh, you know, for our purposes, for me, that would all be synonymous or the mind even. That's fine with me, too. Descartes going to talk lots about the mind. Um, right. So that there has to be something there having those experiences. And I claim and it's a pretty radical claim. 
metaphysically is that I don't think it's your, you're aware of yourself as a body experiencing these things. I think you're aware of yourself as an immaterial thing, uh, having these experiences. No, I, I, I get, I think I get where you're coming from. I really do. Okay. Um, it seems similar or maybe on the same track as the kind of thinking where, uh, if you strip everything away and there's just the experience, yeah. the qualia of experience, then uh, that we're calling is the soul, right? And I well, think that's not quite. Idea. Not nope. quite. The, the qualia, again, what I'm saying is there has to be something that the quali that um, in, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember the exact terminology here, like the, the self is what exemplifies or instantiates the qualia. So like the qualia, for those that aren't familiar with that term, would be like the felt texture of an experience. But I think of that as still a kind of like uh, property or aspect of the experience. In a way, just to put it in really crude terms, um, I'm saying there has to be an owner of those experiences. There has to be something that's having that experience. And that's really driving down that ontological path to say, what is this? What is it that's having the experience? So the, the experiences can't be where we locate identity. Because those come and they go and they change and, uh, you know, so on. I might have memories for a time that gives us a kind of continuity. But like I said, I keep losing those. Uh, so that can't be where my identity is grounded, especially like a kind of numerical identity over time. Um, we need something that has those experiences that's, that's with me right here, right now, that was with me, you know, 10 years ago and will be with me and I, I don't even like to say with me, but like is me uh, 10 years from now, that that's grounds that sort of continuity or identity over time, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. But why can't that be the brain? Well, here's where I want to say, and, and I just completely grant that this is a very massive metaphysical commitment. I say that in the post that a lot of people aren't going to want to go down this path because it's going to commit them to a world far beyond uh, the natural, material, physical world. But my suggestion is that when we really attend to and reflect on our experience, um, sorry, my dog's going on. Uh, we are aware of the conscious <clears throat> self. And I think when we begin to reflect on what the conscious self is, it doesn't have any properties of the brain. In other words, I, and this is, I, is a little bit of a cheeky point, but um, I don't, I'm not aware at all of myself having a brain, at least not directly, right? I've been told I have a brain. Uh, I, you know, I've seen an, at least some animals, I think, brains uh, at some point or other. I'm not like a big hunter or anything, but um, right. I think I've seen at least a, a animal's brain. Uh, maybe I've seen an open, you know, uh, or a brain surgery on TV or something like that. So I know that some bodies seem to have brains, but I don't, I, I know that on somewhat weak evidence that I even have a brain. And I know that opens me up to all kinds of jokes in the, um, in the co comments probably. But uh, what I'm saying is I, I don't know that I, I have, you know, it's like my evidence for that is fairly weak in a sense, whereas I, I know better than I know almost anything else that I'm a, um, that I have, that I'm a conscious self. And so the, the task is to say, well, what is the self? And that's where it's, it gets hard to say, why would it be a brain brain? The properties of a brain seems so radically different from the properties of my conscious experience. It's not clear to me how a brain could instantiate the qualia, as you mentioned, or the sort of intentionality of my thoughts and that sort of a thing. I can imagine these kind of properties for a brain. It's got a certain weight, uh, certain dimensions, right? These are all sort of physical. It's got a, it's got a sort of chemistry to it. By the way, I do believe I have a brain. If that wasn't clear, I do believe that. I was saying that if you really start to think about it, it's a little shocking how little evidence we have to know that each of us do, in fact, have a brain, uh, right? Um, and if we were to if we were to get 
opened up and sort of get all of our, our details of our brain, all the properties of our brain, you would never find thoughts. You would never find experience. You would never find intuitions. You would never find feelings. Uh, at best, what one could do is correlate areas of the brain that light up you know, when you're say experiencing pleasure or when you're experiencing pain or something like that. But that's certainly not identity, right? That's, that's mere correlation. Um, and everybody, you know, I mean, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people recognize this. This is just the mind body problem that these things seem so fundamentally different. And what I'm saying is when I, when I reflect on what I am as a conscious self, there's nothing in my experience. I have no good evidence to think that the conscious experience is nothing over and above my brain processing or something like that, or brain life. Hmm. Um, so I want to, I wanted to pull up a picture of it, but we're just going to have to use our imagination. Um, okay. <laughs> a house of cards. Yeah. Imagine I build a, a nice grandiose house of cards um, out of a 52 card deck. Um, this house, we're going to call it Jimmy. So the house has a name for some reason. We named it Jimmy. Okay. Now I could I like take it. each card out of the deck, out of the house and replace it one by one. It would still be, we could yeah. call it Jimmy. That's the ship of Theseus. That's uh mundane. But, uh, what is interesting is if the cards are, the cards have the house has floors it has levels uh, but that feature is nowhere in the deck of cards the property of floors is not in the deck of cards but it's in the house of cards um the the fragility of the house of cards the the level of shaking of the table that it takes to topple it or uh mm -hmm. perhaps the uh the integrity the level of integrity that's probably a better way to say it. That's a feature or a property of the house of cards yeah. that is totally separate from the cards themselves. And I think that that mm -hmm. is a, an analogous kind of way of thinking of how consciousness or jimminess emerges from the brain. It, does that, is that a good analogy? Are you seeing where I'm coming from there? Yeah. So then you, you wouldn't be a strict physicalist. And that's what I was curious about because um and you wouldn't be a strict materialist um if if you think and i i'm you you tell me if i'm if i'm getting your point here or not uh if you think that consciousness is something that arises from the brain so it's 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 an analogy and we of course don't need to beat up on the analogy but it's not like something um categorically different arises as a property when it comes to the house of cards right these are still all you know fragility or integrity like these are still things that sort of are in the category of physical properties but when you think about consciousness and you know plenty of people have pointed this out too um consciousness seems to be categorically different from neural firings and you know brain chemistry and length width and height and mass and all the other properties of the brain but that's a that's a that's a really important view this is a view that a lot of people do in fact take and again many non-religious people and some religious people take the view that the brain what happens is that consciousness is this whole new thing and it's and they might even recognize somebody like john searle would recognize that it's got these radically new properties, even these properties that aren't had by the brain and couldn't be had by the brain, but consciousness arises or emerges as the, I think you used that word a second ago. And now you have this whole new thing. So that's not a strict physicalist anymore or strict materialism because the world does sort of have these at least properties that are non-physical, non-material in that sort of sense is that you follow me so there's this strict materialist yeah, view that just yeah. says there's no nothing immaterial about the world at all it's a pretty radical view and there's though a lot of people will 
identify as materialists or physicalists or so on, um, I actually think a lot of people are, are going to lean more towards this sort of emergentism view that says, um, and this is sometimes called property dualism or, um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on the cat. There's a, there's a, with physical, there's a kind of physicalism that this is because you would say all we are are bodies or physical bodies, but on these physical bodies supervenes this sort of mental life that, that arises from the physical base. So it's like the crude way to think of it is like your brain has mental properties like consciousness and intentionality and, and these sorts of things. But those property, it's a dualism of sorts not substance dualism but it's a kind of property dualism because intentionality is not a property not a physical property it seems it seems like being its own category yeah i mean it's like uh honesty it, you believe your name is travis dickinson and i ask you what is your name and you say travis dickinson then honesty has happened in reality but there's no particles being honest you know there's no real yeah physical nature to that uh honesty except for the ones in your brain of course uh they are not in the state of lying i guess yeah, wait a minute no that, that that's, that's 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 material right there yeah brain uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay uh well it's it's interesting so if, to bring up something like honesty because that would be a kind of moral property um and i think moral properties have the same sort of problem that mental properties have or, or properties of the, the self. Um, and that is they're hard, they're hard to locate in a materialistic worldview too, because particles can't be honest. You can't, you know, sort of, you can't, it seems very difficult at least. I, I, you know, there are a lot of uh, Christian philosophers through the, you know, and apologists that'll say things like, if you're an atheist, you can't have morality. Well, that's not my view. And, and in part, what I'm trying to do in this post is say, I think we can get actually a lot closer than, you know, it's sometimes thought by both atheists and, um, you know, Christian philosophers and religious philosophers, because um, I think you could hold to the existence of the soul and be an atheist. I think you can hold to moral facts and moral properties like honesty uh, and be an atheist too. I, I, I think that's, it, it sits a little ill with your view. I, I, I and you know, so I, I do think that there is, I think it's, those things are explained better by Christian theism, um, ultimately just in terms of a sort of philosophical worldview. Uh, but ho hopefully you hear a little more, uh, moderate, you know, modest sort of claim coming from me that I don't think it's, I think it's just wrong for Christian apologists to say that if you believe in moral facts and if you're an atheist, you're just thereby, you know, contradicting yourself or something. Um, I think it sits ill. I think it's better explained, right? It's, it's an odd thing to just sort of suppose exists, but there's, you know, guys like Aaron, Eric Weilenberg, who's a, a moral realist, um, um, right? So he calls it um, godless ethics or something to that effect. Um, so he believes in moral facts. He, he doesn't think, but he's not a, he's not a strict physicalist. He's not a strict materialist. Um, he's kind of a Platonist in this sense. And that's, that's kind of, that's really the purpose of the, the post was not to I mean, it, it was to argue for the, the rights of the unborn, but but part of one purpose was to say that this doesn't have to be a religious issue. It doesn't have to be because some Bible verses. In fact, I say in the post that I don't think the Bible is very clear on the personhood of, <laughs> of the fetus. Um, I think the framework that it provides kind of leads you there. Again, like I'm not saying these are all just like, take whatever view you want, you want to. I, I don't think many atheists are going to want to say that there is the soul. And there are plenty of atheists, guys like Michael Ruse, who deny the existence of moral facts. Um, but I think one could hold those. And that's the kind of modest claim I'm making. No, um, I think that, uh, well, that uh, being locked into naturalism, I think that natural is a interesting phrase. But uh, yeah. 
I think that if God exists, then he is nature. And so anything he does would be natural. And so supernatural is a superfluous term. It, it could be. Uh, yeah, I, I, I've always thought, I mean, I, I'm with you that this distinction between natural entities and non-natural entities is somewhat of an arbitrary uh, distinction. I think physical or material versus non-physical or immaterial. Did I say that right? So physical and then non-physical, uh, material and immaterial, like that distinction, I think it makes a whole lot more uh, intuitive sense than natural and supernatural or natural and non-natural as philosophers will talk about non-natural properties. And I just, it just feels really arbitrary because uh, what I think of as natural to me, yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Like there's a very real sense in which my belief in God, I think of God as just a very natural entity. Now he's not part of physical nature again, but that just brings us back to this physical notion. He's not a part of nature in that sense, but, um, but yeah, I, I superfluous. I'm kind of, I'm kind of with you on that. I think that's a good point. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah. So souls, brains, um, <laughs> and the unborn, where do I want to go? Yeah. Uh, so we haven't even really gotten into the argument yet. We're kind of still in the preamble. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, a little bit, yeah. Let's move along into the argument. Okay. Uh, let me see. Is this the right one? Nope, that's not the right one. Uh, well, I guess I already clicked on it, so let's just touch on it then. Okay. Uh, you could draw this. This is a... Here, let me go back. <laughs> the case for the person of the unborn. The first step is human persons are embodied souls we have talked about that a lot uh you said that this is not a religious argument right uh, <laughs> even though i know that that's going to be you know a lot of people's reaction but i don't think it's religious because it's not again it's not being drawn from the bible uh it's not being drawn from a creed uh i i think i'm the argument that i've laid out a little bit so far of just being aware of your conscious self is a purely non-religious claim so far. So that, that's what I meant there. Okay. Uh, what I just flashed on the screen there was a couple of quotes from Plato and Descartes. And all I was trying to do okay. there is just try to make the, the case that these two guys were, in fact, religious men. Uh, they believed in God to some in some kind of concept, and they yep. got yep. shown in their work. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you think that that presupposition affected their reasoning when they were making these arguments i don't think so at least so again you know somebody could uh say to me hey you really are just i mean obviously you're christian you're just trying to smuggle in these these religious concepts and i in fact that was some of the reaction that i got on social media when i posted this post post and i just want to say uh, it really is not. I, I really think if I'm as, as being as honest as I can as approaching this, even if I became an atheist, I would still hold to something like Eric Weilenberg's view about moral facts. And while I don't have a good example of somebody who's an atheist philosopher who holds the existence of the soul, uh, at least off the top of my head, I do think there are some that I've that I've read along the way. But um, I would hold to that, too. I, I don't I don't have any. I don't have any religious import with that um, to think that the, the soul, that the conscious self exists. And, it, and certainly, historically, um, people have not held to at least the same religious view or for the same reasons. Now, it's important that I say this, too, that I don't think that this believing in the existence of the soul entails that there's an afterlife. It could be the case that our souls come into existence at the moment of conception is where we're probably headed here in a minute, um, on my view, and that it could be the case that the soul passes out of existence at the moment of death. Um, I'm not saying that, right, we exist as Casper the ghost or, or whatever um, beyond that, though that, that could be someone's view. And if somebody... Certainly, if somebody has a, an afterlife view, then they probably do believe in something like the soul. But part of it for me, I, if I'm being honest with you, 
I think that the I, I'm convinced that the soul exists, and I think rather than that uh, me being a Christian give me reason to believe that, I think it's kind of the other way around for me at least, is that I believe in the existence of the soul. And then when I think about how to understand that and sort of what view kind of makes good sense of that, among other things, I think uh, I think that gives me reason for my Christianity versus you see that so versus the other way around. And, and another point about the Plato Descartes thing is that, yeah, I mean, Plato is definitely religious. But again, when you read his um writings and I didn't c catch everything you, you flashed up there because I was probably talking when it was not my turn no, to yeah. talk but uh uh i i don't think those arguments that plato gives for the existence of the soul that descartes gives for the existence of of the soul are religiously motivated you know he's not giving religious reasons so again like you could claim that but really deep down that's the that's the hidden thing but it's like i i hope people are a bit more charitable that way um because I think you have to take it at face value. And we could say that for every claim. We could just say, oh, you believe in, you're an atheist because you don't, you know, you don't, uh, you, you hate your father. So, the, you know, I don't know, like, you know what I mean? Like we could always sort of like, you know, accuse people of having these secret beliefs that are really doing the heavy lifting in your views. But I would suggest as a principle of charity that I wanna be somebody that doesn't do that to you or to others. Uh, and I hope people don't just hear me and say, oh, I bet he's just a Christian. That's why he's saying that. Well, I mean, for Plato, I don't know. I have no idea. I wouldn't even try to okay. make that But for Descartes, <laughs> I mean, okay. reading more, the, the meditations on moral philosophy, uh, that what, what I flashed on there was a pre, was part from the, uh, I think the preamble or the foreword. Uh, it said, I have long had fixed in my mind the belief yeah. that an all-powerful God existed by whom I have been created such as I am. Uh, and when I read that, this is at the beginning of the Meditations on First Philosophy, where he uh, makes his whole argument, supposedly, from totally scratch. And there is, he is pretty much explaining his presupposition. I believe that there is a God. I'm going to... It seems like he's going to reason from that point of view no matter what. But I mean, you're right. It is uh, a little bit uncharitable. I I, I admit yeah. that I am uh, reading into it. You might say, well, a little bit. But uh, the meditations too. He starts with having all kinds of beliefs, and then Descartes' project is to doubt all of his beliefs and, in a sense, get rid of them and see what he's left with. Right. So this is the flow of Descartes' meditations. And he, so he starts doing that sort of systematically doubting everything he can, or uh, method, met, his methodological doubt. So he's, he, he talks about uh, doing a demolition on everything that he believes. So he's, he's trying to throw out all of his beliefs and see what's left, something that he cannot doubt. And that's the one line in philosophy everybody knows, right? Where he gets to the place where he says, I think, therefore I am. And he realizes that's the base that's the base he's thrown out everything he doesn't he's thrown out all kinds of stuff that i don't know that i'd be willing to throw out things like awareness of my mental states and he's thrown out mathematics and things like that and he gets down to i am i exist or i think therefore i am and then he a tiny step beyond that he says what what's the i what what is what's me like what's the i am that i just came up that i stumbled on there and he says, I am a thinking thing. And that's really, in a way, his argument for the soul is that he's, he realizes he doesn't know that he's a body. He's doubted that. That's thrown out. He, could, he can doubt that he's a body, but he can't doubt that he's this sort of thinking thing. Um, and I, I, that's, that's very reminiscent of the argument that I'm trying to propose to say that we are directly aware of ourselves as as sort of these conscious things um, and not fundamentally aware of ourselves as bodies. I wanted to ask you about Descartes' meditations. Do you, so, I mean, obviously, I mean, for me, especially, like it's been like, I don't know how many years since I even read it. Uh, sure. I couldn't tell you, I couldn't even give you a very good uh, outline of his argument, but yeah, okay. just from your impression of memory, uh, 
would you say that when you read it, you were in agreement with his general flow of reasoning? Yeah, I do. I, a lot of people give Descartes a hard time, but I actually am a big fan. Uh, I think that methodological doubt as a project to do the demolition work of really questioning all of our beliefs, right? This is, this is kind of, this is kind of my thing. Uh, in fact, I just had a, I have a book. It's not going to be released till October 18th, but, um, I do have a promo code to give to the listeners if you're interested in that, but, uh, it's oh, yeah. called wandering toward God. And the wow. subtitle is finding faith amid doubts and big questions. And so my whole sort of approach to these things is to say, like, we should be questioning everything, like everything. And Descartes doesn't, it's, it's only later in the meditations that, that Descartes gives an argument for God's existence, because he's got to sort of build that back in. So he gets down to realizing that the only thing he really knows is that he exists and that he's a thinking thing. Uh, and then he, and he sort of proceeds to build it all back in if he can. Give me that title again, Wandering Toward God. And... Wandering Toward God, Finding Faith Amid Doubts and Big Questions. Faith amid and, and I've got a nice promo questions. code if anybody's interested in a... It's actually not even pre-order now. They're, the publisher is sending it. Um, so I've, I've had a few friends already get theirs in the mail. So, What is the promo code? Let me just put it in here. And I'll... Promo code is WANDER22. W -A -N -E. And you've got to go to the publisher's website for that. That's only going to work at the publisher's web website. And that is uh, IV Press. So it's IVP, University Press. But their website, as I recall, is IVPress.com, I want to say. I Actually, let me look that up, make sure. Yeah, IV, IVPress.com. IVPress.com. All right. I am going to have that screening, scrolling on the here in a few seconds. So w -A -N -D -E -R off. 22 Yes, W-A-N-D-E-R-22. 30% off. off and free shipping. So it's a pretty sweet... Uh, I was a little surprised they gave it to me, but they said use it however you like, and I'd love to give your folks uh, that if they're interested. No pressure, of course. Definitely written from a Christian perspective, but it's saying that doubt is a very good thing. Uh, uh, the process of sort of like questioning our faith and pressing in, having doubts, like this is a good thing to do so that we press in and find truth, find answers, and at least have reasons, right? Because I think too many Christians are just adverse to doubts and questions, and I think that's a very bad thing. Does that look good? Nice. That looks beautiful. Okay. So yeah, check that out, ladies and gentlemen. If you are watching this and you are interested, please do. And also, uh, I don't think I've even mentioned this yet, but Dr. Dickinson is linked in the description below, uh, as well as the blog post that this is all uh, in reference to. So if you are curious about that, please check that out. Uh, so um, where are we right now in the conversation? Uh, we are talking about... Descartes, but if you want to Descartes. move beyond Descartes, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so you're not your body. Yeah. Your soul. Um, okay. Let's just get off the soul thing for a little bit. Okay. Uh, given that you are a soul, what is the further argument that compels a person? what establishes the inalienable right okay here i do think we have to get a little religious um in a way i mean it could be the case that one thinks about the soul and so for the purpose of the blog post i was assuming that again most of us think that there are genuine human rights uh, that are inalienable, that are sort of intrinsic to the human person uh, for the sake of the argument. But when we start to wonder about, well, how do we even have those? I suppose there's probably a, a sort of secular, if I could put it that way, secular way or non-religious way to sort of reflect and attend to what you are as a soul and, and come to realize that you're pretty special 
uh, you're something over and above, say, animals and insects and, and rocks and trees, certainly, and, and come up with this kind of inalienable rights for all human beings. But I think for me, it's, again, I, I kind of go to a, a more religious spot with this one. And I would say that we have inherent dignity because we're created. Of course, the Christian view would be to say that we're created in the image of God. So that there's a kind of inherent dignity that humans bear um, as a result of the kind of soul we have. So that applies to the mothers as well, obviously, right? And yes, we absolutely. have kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, I don't know if we want to rehash it entirely, but I mean, the mother's life is at risk from the pregnancy. The the yep. child's life is at threat from the desire for an abortion. And we have a conflict here. Both of them have inalienable rights by this model. So something must give. And now we need something to to determine that. Yeah. So where do we go from there? Well, I think that a way to reason about these issues, these again, like, I want to recognize too that we, you know, we're talking about real lives too. Like people go through these issues and it's horrifying and I can't imagine having to make some of these decisions and so on. And so it's like, I get it again, it's messy and so on, but we're, you know, trying to talk, sort of talk about this a little dispassionately and just sort of consider the moral reasoning and things like that. I think one way to get there is to say, uh, what would you do if it was a 10 year old child or a five year old child? Um, and I think that's a pretty good guide because the five year old child has inalienable rights as, as the mother has an inalienable rights, but the five year old child is certainly a, a burden in a way, right? We've got four kids. We've got four burdens in our lives. Uh, we've got, you know, they need stuff all the time, care and attention and, and so on. Um, uh and so w i think a guide to this so if we've if we've if we've taken that huge metaphysical plunge to say that's what the human person is is that they are rights bearing soul embodied soul as i like to put it then um when there's that conflict um there's plenty of times that my kids are super inconvenient to me <laughs> but uh that doesn't trump their inalienable rights. Um, there's times in which it's they're painful to me, even uh, and pain, you know, to my wife or whatever. Um, she doesn't have the right to end their life, and so I think that's that's a good guide to say. Then, okay, when we're talking about the unborn, then um, when it's going to be inconvenient, that doesn't justify ending the life of this rights bearing human being um when it's there's pain involved that doesn't justify uh ending the life i think it o only when it rises to that level of being life-threatening and then that's clear to me that that really is that i think um especially on the legal front and, and that's something i think i say in the article if, if i don't um i i should have that i think the legal issue is one thing and the moral issues are another thing because I don't think we can always legislate everything according to our moral principles. Um, I don't think it's morally permissible for a you know husband to go be unfaithful to his spouse, but I don't think we should have laws against that, if that makes sense. And so I think there might be reasonable positions we could take where, um, I, I think it's, per, you know, I think it's wrong, say, to maybe maybe my view would be to say something like it's wrong to take the morning after pill because that does cause an abortion. But I might be persuaded and I'm really being honest here that I, I'm not fully convinced either way. I might be persuaded that legally we shouldn't prevent that. Even though I do think it's more we wrong. shouldn't prevent which one the, the, the morning more after pill where one takes a, an, an abort, um, abortifacent, I think it's called, uh, a pill that will cause, if, if there's a 
conception, it will it will in effect kill that fetus, that embryo. That was a question I wanted to ask you. So, the conception requires two phases. There's the 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 uh, the fertilization of the egg, and then there's the implantation of the embryo. And yes. The abortion pill, as I understand it, can prevent the implantation. Right. Uh, which ultimately so, kills the, causes the death of the, the, the embryo. Right. Is there any, right. Yeah. so that's more like a, a shield, right? It's kind of. Uh, I don't, to me, no, because I think it is intentionally, it's, it's a procedure that intentionally kills the embryo i think it's right to call it an embryo at this stage um or the fertilized egg or whatever uh right if yeah so i, I think what i would say there is no that's still the the intent there is to is to end the life of the embryo um well let's, let's i want to push back on that um yeah i don't think that the intent of any abortion is necessarily to kill the embryo it is simply okay. just to end the pregnancy and that relationship. But yeah, but that the, sounds the death a little... of the embryo is just an unavoidable. Uh, yeah, that sounds semantics to me. I don't know if you've seen Bill Burr's uh, <laughs> recent um, comedy bit on this. Anyway, I, I won't even try to uh, relate it, but that's it's it's of course hilarious. But he's he's saying, look. <laughs> Uh, it's murder. I mean, however you slice it. And he's pro-choice. He's, he's for abortion, but he's like, let's just be honest. So uh, not saying that you're not being honest, but um, that sounds like semantics to me. I mean, ending a pregnancy, what is the pregnancy? Well, it's when a, when you're with child, with your, when you're with, or however you want to put it is medically, you know, with all the medical terminology, if you'd like, but there is a fertilized egg involved. Um, and I think, the intent to me, I don't see a material difference between ending the pregnancy and ending the life of the fertilized egg, if you like to put it that way. Well, I mean, there may not be a material difference. It may just be the intent. But I think that intent is a is a great thing to to take into account. And I think that uh, when we're trying to delineate what actions are moral versus immoral, but also trying to prescribe uh, legislation for the future. We need to take into account the intent because the intent because future technologies and procedures won't be bound by the same restrictions as the ones of today, and only the intent will matter at that point. It won't matter uh, what is the actual results of the procedure of today because that procedure of tomorrow won't have the same uh, results. I'm not sure. I know. I, I'm not sure I follow you. What do, what do you mean? Won't have the same results? For instance. Today we have to end in a preg end a pregnancy by uh, suction and dilation and cuterage and all that thing, right? But tomorrow we along. might be able to push a button and do a teleportation of the entire ah. placenta and everything. Yeah. And so in in that case, now we have a whole new technology with a whole other uh, outcome. So what do we do with this teleported fetus? So if the intention was in fact to kill the fetus, well then that teleported fetus just goes in the trash. But if the intention was never to kill the fetus, well, then we have other things to think about. Yeah. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And, you know, um, I'd have to think a little more about that. But I, I think that there's a lot of things that we can say, like, again, with like a newborn baby or something like that, like, you know, if, if, if a parent, say, starved their newborn baby, and you said, my intent was just to not to go broke on, you know, food, buying, buying groceries and food and that kind of a thing. Um, I wasn't intending to kill the child. I think that person would still, you know, be said to be morally responsible for killing that child. Um, so it's an interesting thought experiment. I'd have to think a little more about it. But I think that I think at this yeah, because I think what you're imagining is is other ways to end the pregnancy, right? That don't require not the death. necessarily. Yeah, that doesn't require 
require the death. Um, I guess what I might just sort of push on still here too is just that we just don't have that option. And so at this point in time, that ending the pregnancy just means killing the fetus or the embryo or removing or however we want to put it. Well, I mean, we're getting close. Yeah. I, I see your point though. Um, the teleportation? No, no, not teleportation, <laughs> but uh, artificial okay. wounds and things like that. Uh, they, they are right, right, developing definitely. those. Uh, and I, I think I'm, <laughs> I was going to say, I, that's news to me, but no, uh, I think that if there were ways to, you know, that were very safe to uh, have artificial, I, I'm not against that. Um, but I think that, man, there's just going to, there's got to be a huge jump in technological advance with those things so that the life of the child is not, you know, seriously in danger, uh, by going through that process. Um, and, and again, there's going to be lots and lots of sort of practical implications of the cost and who pays the cost and, and, and those kind of things, um, but yeah, I mean, there's there's so many couples that would love to adopt. And of course, adoption is so very expensive. And so if there's ways in which we could safely remove um, an unborn child and, and have it sort of incubate in a um, artificial womb, or I'm not sure if incubate's the right word or not, but uh, develop an artificial womb and then can be adopted. You know, like, I, I think that's well, fine, I mean like, because we've not we've not destroyed a lot it's, it's not fine it really is it's, it's a it's a whole other can of worms i mean uh i looked at a survey there's like i think something like 0 0.32 or something I, i'm not being precise on the number less than half of a hectare of land of arable land for every person on the planet right now that's a, a, a an observation verifiable observation that has been made okay so i mean the the population it, it, we are overpopulated i don't care what anybody says that they can repeat that lie all they want to but less than that because the the lifestyles that we live today are not sustainable in order to mm -hmm. create a sustainable lifestyle we need to be able to produce food in a way that is not mass manufactured and you're not going to be able to do that with everybody clumped together in little uh with everybody spread out the way that we are you know yeah it's just and population is increasing people are not trying to curtail their reproductive habits in any kind of way and this is a logarithmic function so it's just going to keep getting worse so i don't yeah i don't, I don't know though that why people think that uh childbirth is something that we can just not we can ignore it, it, this is a big deal yeah, no, I, I get that too. Um, and I, you know, of course, don't know about statistics and so on. Um, I'm going to look it up. I, th I think that in terms of moral reasoning, again, kind of going back to where I uh, make a living with the philosophy is we don't want to start with a problem like that and therefore make our moral conclusions. I think we've got it sort of backwards if we do it that way. I think rather we need to decide, sort of work out the morality of our options first and then decide which is the best option to address that problem. Um, and so, because again, like we could solve that problem by nuking a few countries and that would also, but nobody's gonna take that, uh, hopefully nobody's gonna take that very seriously. Uh, I've got a few people in mind that might, but, uh, you know, they're, they're crazy. Um, right. That would solve that problem, but of course that wouldn't be moral. And so I think we just have to start in the right place where we work out what are our morally permissible options relative to this problem and then proceed to try to address the problem rather than the other way around. No, no, I, I, I'm not saying that abortion is the solution to overpopulation, but just that okay. once we abandon abortion and all these other birth control measures, all these other there problems will be, are be a lot worse. It'd be aggravated. Yeah, no, that I think that's a good point. And I, I think of, um, you know, the women who are not in great situations to be able to have kids. Like I think 
there's a lot of really there's a lot of real world issues that don't get brought up nearly enough and don't get it that need to be addressed all in the same sort of conversation in some ways um my church for example like we're we're heavily involved in in various crisis pregnancy um centers that again some people think these are just trying to prevent abortions but they're really not that most of their funds at least the ones that we're connected with most of their funds go to helping uh moms that and, and families and uh others who are in tough situations where they're not able to you know kind of meet all the needs uh, especially the kids and so we we provide diapers and clothing and and money in some cases and you know we've got to do all like that's a moral imperative too so i think there's a lot of messiness on all sides here um i think when i though go back to what is the most fundamental thing that we need to get figured out um i i still stick with it figuring out is the fetus uh, a a human person with rights and i i'm convinced that that it, they are and then and then we have all the messiness that we have to address as humans and do this together uh and, and not just sort of say now that we overturn roe v wade right our job is done here or something like all of you know our efforts should be going into helping kids and adoptive families and things like that for sure because there's I, it kills me to think about um you know single moms that would be forced to have a child that they don't want by the law i still think that's the right moral position but i think that's a really difficult thing and i think that that we need to come beside her and walk with her as best we can provide what she needs um and then if she doesn't want the child uh after the child's born then you know work on having a whole network of adoptive families and so on to to care for these kids uh, we need to be pro life in all senses for sure so I, I don't want to come right back to that. I just want to clear up that uh, it is as a the source was the World Bank uh, from okay. September 2022. This is uh, I got this from tradingeconomics.com and the figure was 0 0.184 rounded uh, hectares, which if you translate that into acres, that's about 0 0.45 acres. So about a little less than half of an acre per person of arable land right now in the world. Um, it's probably arable is like not, you know, the Arctic circle or something. Right, right. Uh, usable for- uh, Yeah, for yeah, out. livable or something. Right. Okay, interesting. Um, so the question of, uh, I'm sorry, can you just remind me uh, before I, I, I shouldn't have uh, gone on that little tangent. Um, you were just talking about um being pro-life in all be, all respects but more specifically being, you were saying okay. that uh i'm sorry <laughs> my brain oh part. you're fine support i was saying that we need to support uh women who are in these you know tough situations when they're pre you know i mean we need to support them in any case but um especially with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, I just think that it's a moral imperative on us to care for women who need help in whatever way we can. And if they don't want help, that's totally fine, of course. But that we would that we would uh, not just like kind of get Roe v. Wade overturned and say we're pro-life and now you have to have your babies and things like that. And then just say, but good luck on on life. I think we need to supply you know diapers and, and money and all the rest oh, of it um, okay. yes. as much as we can as well as adoptive families uh because i know they're out there like i know it's just so ridiculously expensive to try to adopt that it, when you, you don't go through like the foster system which is a very honorable way to do it too but um there's a lot of families that are wanting to adopt and i say we need to be at the front lines of that myself um so when a lot of people will uh, agree that abortion should be illegal, but at the same time, they would like more social support for pregnant mothers and children. And they would also say that abortion, they may not say this entirely, but they, they may say something 
uh, on a graded scale to this effect that abortion may not be so such a good idea per se until we get that kind of infrastructure in place some people will go as far as to say that we shouldn't have abortion until we get that in place some people will not even approach that but i'm wondering where you are on that yeah i i would say so i'm i'm a pretty you know i'm a conservative and on the on a lot of these issues so i i think that the government just does a terrible job at these things um and the the wastefulness and the the ways in which like we we dedicate so much money to these sorts of things and then it doesn't actually get to the people in need like that's that's stuff that i just drives me crazy and so and when i look at like what my church does and other uh pregnancy centers and they don't shove you know the religious convictions down their throat at all like it's there if somebody wants to talk and of course they're gonna you know identify who they are and, and, and be all up front about it but um i just think they're far more effective and and other organizations too it doesn't have to be a religious organization but there's a lot of them that are religious um religious organizations uh, i would be very fine with a secular you know, I mean, what I'm trying to describe is like a secular pro-life, you know, center for, for women and others to go to uh, get help in these areas. But again, I think that we have to go from the moral convictions first and then talk about the practicality and so on and, and the legality. So I think we got to get the, that, those moral convictions. And that's pr primarily what I've been talking about. And I think what we've been talking about is the moral side of it. Um, that's not the same thing as talking about the legislative side of it and the law side of it. Because I think, again, there's a lot of things that I think are wrong and immoral. Like, I think it's wrong to tell a lie, but I'm, I don't think that, <laughs> right? I don't think that there should be a federal law against lying that you find yourself in jail if you told any lie whatsoever. I mean, it might clean things up in Congress, right? But that, you know, uh, but, uh, right? So there are plenty of things that I think are wrong, morally speaking, that I think should be legally permissible. And so we could be pro-life and have our moral positions. And I think somebody could have that sort of idea to say, well, look, we shouldn't do this until we've got the support in place. I don't, you know, sort of on the legal front, uh, I think that's a respectable position, though, at the same time, like, I think what a lot of people don't realize, and again, like, there's lots of caricatures and lots of people who are uh, on both sides, of course, but um, what sometimes comes to us as conservatives or people that are pro-life is that, um, uh, right, all we care about is, like, these pregnancies and women's bodies and things like that. And it's really not, it really is like this conviction that what's happening in an abortion is the ending of a, of a life, a ending of a, of a rights bearing human person's life. Um, and if that's the case, then I think most of us would probably side with saying like, let's, let's get whatever done as soon as possible to save lives. Like, you know what I mean? It's sort of like freeing the, freeing the um I, I hate to use a holocaust example because somebody's going to think that i'm just giving emotional sort of example i'm not trying to compare these two i'm just saying like there was a kind of moral imperative to stop the holocaust and if we had said let's get all of our support stuff in place first and you know a couple of years later we'll go in and make sure we stop the holocaust and like no it's sort of like look people are dying every day we need to get in there and, and and again, I'm not comparing these as morally equivalent sort of things, but um, uh, it sounds to me somewhat analogous that like, and again, to understand the sort of pro-life approach here is, is to see that if you follow the logic of what I've said and you would, and you agree, which again, I'm not assuming you do, but, uh, or anybody watching does, but you come to the conclusion that this fetus is a rights bearing human person uh and we got to stop the unjust killing of this rights bearing human person and there's a sort of moral imperative that i think outstrips our 
need to be sort of practically well supported, um, you know, in, 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 the, in the, the sort of thing that the scenario that you described. Sorry, that was a long winded answer you're... to that question. No, yeah. you're fine. Thank you. I appreciate it. Especially when I bring this part in, just please feel free to <laughs> start talking. You're good. But, uh, um, but what, the way I see it, um, I've become convinced from looking at the various sources that I've looked at uh, that the life of the mother is at is in is in a state of being threatened by simple virtue of her becoming pregnant. I don't need. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of you know the different conditions that could increase that risk and whatnot, but that is yeah. totally immaterial to me. All all that matters is that that life, her life, is at risk, and I believe that people have a fundamental right to defend their lives with lethal force if necessary. To me, the fetus is a hu is a human, is a life. That's fine. I grant those premises entirely. But sure. the, it is analogous to a a, a person with a uh, an end stage brain tumor pressing on their amygdala, causing them to have homicidal tendencies when you've invited them into your house for dinner. And now they're threatening to kill your wife. And it might just be a wait, 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 wait. I, I missed the analogies. So you, so, you've got uh, something on your brain stem so causing so, homicide. You into your house. Oh, and that person with that condition is invited into yeah. their house. Got it. Okay. Got you've you. You've invited Sorry. them into your house uh, for dinner. This person has yeah. a, a end stage brain tumor pressing on their amygdala and it's causing them to have extreme homicidal tendencies. And now they're threatening to kill your wife. I believe you have every right to kill that person. Now it's no fault of their own. They have no blame in this action and it's they might not even do it. There's a there's a chance that this could be some something else entirely uh but you the threat is there. It is real and you yeah. must respond or risk losing your wife and it would be dereliction of duty to just sit, sit idly by. So to me I I feel that you you must act uh if you wish to preserve the lives of your wife and that you have every right to not act the, the the wife in that analogy could say you know what it's fine don't just sit there i'll, I'll handle it blah 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 right but yeah if somebody is in your house threatening your family threatening you yeah you have the right to defend your life and this this it, fetus it's not their fault that they're in the, the womb it's not their fault that they're threatening the life they're okay. innocent that's fine i'm but the threat is there and it is real and so response must it, it requires response it would be as if uh, um it's like when we kill viruses and bacteria they they are innocent lives that have no cognition whatsoever now of course they don't have yeah. any potential so we don't care but if they had potential if there was a chance that a a biofilm could become sentient then maybe we'd have some more qualms about uh antibacterial sanitization and stuff like that i don't know but still nope <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i think that's a really interesting argument um i think in fact i think that's one of the more plausible arguments for abortion because i think what i like that you're doing or or commend you for doing is like recognizing the unborn as something substantial and potentially uh having dignity and and so on like you're not denying that necessarily by this argument so i think that's whereas a lot of pro-choice arguments just sort of skip that whole thing and you know kind of go right to the the rights that a woman has to the autonomy you know body autonomy and so on um i think with any analogy of course it's only as good as it's like the thing it's meant to be an analogy for Right. So especially arguments by analogy, uh, if it's too if it's too unlike the situation, uh, then it's not a, a very strong argument. Uh, in, you know, this is just in general. Right. I teach. Sorry, I teach logic and critical thinking. So they, and they have a book about that, too. But uh, uh, so this is just sort of in a general sense, that's the first thing to say. I think probably where you and I honestly disagree um, and probably and may very well end the show uh, tonight d still disagreeing with this 
is whether or not that's a good analogy for a pregnancy. Um, I think it's a good analogy for a situation in which the many, though it's a very low percentage of, of pregnancies that have these conditions, but there are some conditions in which that pregnancy genuinely threatens the life of the mother that there's a very good chance because i think the way you spelled out that analogy is there's a very good chance that this person does in fact attempt to inflict harm because that there wasn't good chance and they're having some sort of problems mentally and you know you know with this condition that they have but they're not hostile right then you i don't think you then do have the right to to you know protect your spouse in that case, so it's that it only when... analogous on the axis of probability of actual harm. Yes, yes. So we would judge when do we, and it, again, it's messy. So we're not going to have this definite line at like here's when it becomes okay to you know act in self defense. Um, there's going to and we're going to disagree even like the people legitimately disagree about how much threat there has to be for somebody who's in your house. Uh, and that's that's being, you know, acting a little like aggressively and so on. You can't just take a gun out and shoot them. Um, it has to be when they, you know, somebody might say, well, it's only when they bear a weapon or they, you know, start to move towards a sort of more violent um, posture and things like that. And that then becomes more analogous, I think, to the condi the medical conditions in which the fetus is truly threatening the life of the mother. Um, but you know, the percentage is very, very low that there will be a genuine threat to the mother's life. Again, like as long as we're not talking like uh, um, taking care of the as long as the mother takes care of herself. And um, well, why would we assume that? Well, I'm just saying, like, you do the things that you have to do anyways. Right. There's there's a little bit of a heightened need to take care of yourself when you're pregnant, of course, but you know, you could get yourself in a bad state there, but I just think I, to me, I would assume that again, falls under like, so again, my reasoning that I'm going to keep coming back to is like, what, how, what do you, what is the mother obligated to do to a, a child, like a five-year-old or a one-year-old, it doesn't matter. Uh, wherever somebody thinks that there's genuine rights that and genuine uh, parental obligations. Um, so I think there's a parental obligation on the mother because of what the fetus is to treat her own body well and, and so on, um, so that it doesn't put her life or the fetus's life in jeopardy myself. But, um, uh, I think I was going to say something else there. Um, so I, I guess the point again is just the analogy that you give is closer to one in which there's a relatively rare medical condition that, that truly called, but that's where, I, where we're agreeing that when it's a genuine threat to the mother's life, I think that there are uh, permissible abortions in that case. I see where you're coming from and I can see why you would feel that way. Um, it would take a lot, way more than I'm even capable of doing at this moment to even begin to try to make the argument that the risk to the mother is much higher than you seem to perceive it to be. Okay. Uh, but I will think about how to make that case. Okay. Maybe we'll have a discussion. <laughs> well, or I'll just make a video guess, that is the explanation. Yeah, yeah. No, I would love to hear it uh, because I think, again, like I say, I think your your argument's a, a really interesting one and, and a good one. That's, that's probably the, the best sort of approach um, is to think about those sorts of things um, rather than just bl a blanket body autonomy, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I guess all I have in mind is just that there are billions, I think would be the right uh, quantifier there. There's been billions of women who have had babies um successfully and i think you can just look at the percentages of when you know without uh medical intervention um or or even like prior to the advent of these sorts of things how many women died in childbirth and and it certainly was more you know 
prior to our technological advances and things like that. But, um, you know, I think especially today, it's it's relatively low. I, I read, uh, I didn't read the whole thing. I skimmed a study uh, about this. It was a perspective study, some kind of projection about what was going to happen if we banned uh, abortion entirely. And I've already been caught uh, misquoting it one time, so I'm not going to say the number. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there is a perspective study that can be Googled relatively quickly where we'll uh, outline a projection of what will happen if we were to outlaw abortion entirely. And it gives some figures and it's very informative, but I'm not going to quote the numbers off the top of my head okay. because I don't want to misrepresent. Fair enough. Um, I think that we have been going long enough and I don't want to try to rehash any of the issues that we've already gone over. And that's kind of where the rest of my little overlays would uh, take us. Okay. So I think well, that's for I'm the next show. Yeah, I think I would put a pin in it and we'll save it for the next one. Um, yeah. And let's just leave it at that. I do want to just say thank you again so much for joining me and having this conversation. I think it's been illuminating for myself and the audience. And it's, it's been enjoyable for me, especially to put this all together and do the research and read it and be able to put these arguments together for you. Yeah. No, I, I, I've had a great time. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity and um, look forward to talking again sometime. I really do appreciate it. So um, yeah, I just want to say to everybody in the audience, uh, thank you so much for joining us and for participating in the chat. Uh, thank you to Sideshow Nav for helping me in the backs in the background. Uh, so like it if you loved it, share it if you want to spread it, and subscribe because I have much more. Next week, Maya Atkinson is going to be joining me. We're going to do a podcast-style show. We're just going to uh, cover the current events, uh, talk about what's going on in the world, uh, probably do something a little bit more specific, but there'll be more uh, discussion about that later. Uh, and then after that, uh, the week after that, I'm going to have Praise That I Am, uh, Praise I Am uh, on the show. We're going to discuss presuppositional apologetics. So please subscribe and join me for those. And uh, thank you again, everybody. Night, And remember, it's the bridges we build, not the bridges we burn, that give us the edge. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great night. Goodbye.